to the vlog, a new vlog for the week. I feel like now that I video, like I've been giving you guys my food supermarket hauls, when I go to the supermarket and unpack shopping, I'm like, I should probably show the vlog. So please tell me if you think this is boring, but like the comments I get are really funny. So I'm all for it. Just a little food shop by myself, in person, pushed a trolley. I know, I know. I am inspirational. I actually only, I started to feel ill like, 75% of the way in, but I just like took a deep breath, like picked up the last few bits that I needed and sat in my car for five minutes. And I did it, and I'm proud of myself, and I forgot how satisfying it is to go to the supermarket in the evening and get those sweet yellow label deals. I don't know if that's what you call it in America or whatever. They see like when they discount the food at certain times of the day. Ours is always like after 5.30. 24p for a bunch of nectarines. 24p for my butternut squash, 24p, why all choice 24p? My lettuce, my bean sprouts, my mushrooms, what a deal. I'm trying to think what else fun I got this week. Oh, I'm so excited to try this new White Rabbit, which is like one of my favorite gluten-free brands, a vegan aubergine parmigiana, ravioli with roasted aubergine and sun-dried tomato. I've got um, a couple of friends coming at the weekend, so, Got some tequila, you know, make me happy. Um, to make margaritas. And I'm really into this Mexican lime soda water in my margaritas, which I discovered last week. Um, I'm fully addicted to this dip. Mahamara fiery red pepper with, fiery red pepper dip with cherry bell. It's so good and a good alternative if you can't eat like a lot of hummus like if you can't consume legumes i feel like this is a good vibe i'm into it um the oatly cream cheese is also delicious and a good soy free alternative but they didn't have the sun dried tomato one is my favorite they only have plain but it's really good to make pasta queenie um i don't want to get anything that exciting these fake tortilla chips fake you know what i mean like fake cheesy doritos um Apple and elderflower, a superior juice, because I'm gonna make some kind of breakfast prosecco situation with my friends. And well, this is exciting. Got mini sausage rolls and pork pies, vegan but not gluten free. So sorry, Tum Tum, for that. Oh, and two of my favourite sauces in the world. I'm addicted to this Leon brand. Leon is like a fast, like healthy fast food restaurant in the UK, um, and they've just like started doing sauces and stuff you can buy in the supermarket this harissa aioli also the korean style mayo but this ketchup is the the superior ketchup of our household to mango don't be put off by the name or the color it's delicious that's the food haul situation i'll catch up with you guys probably over the weekend um some nice clips and then i'll tell you what i'm reading some other time I'm cooking dinner while sitting down. This is a really basic stir fry, but I just wanted to say this um, coconut amino. Did you do it? Yeah. Tom's been trying to open this supplement of mine for like two days. Um, this coconut amino soy teriyaki alternative is really good if you avoid soy, which lots of people who have endometriosis will. Let me try and zoom in on the ingredients. Where are they in English? I can't find them. Oh yeah, coconut, nectar, sea salt, garlic, onion. So yeah, just wanted to shout that out. I'm having a rice stir fry again because I hate gluten free noodles. Um, 
I didn't film any talking clips this weekend. Oh, I need my glasses. Please help. That's better. Didn't film any talking clips this weekend, lads, because I was having a jolly good time with my friend. My friend did film some nice clips on her fancy iPhone for me, so you would have seen that. We went out to this most gorgeous new, like, bar restaurant situation, like, um, further down the coast, and had a lot of blood orange spicy margaritas. Anyway, it's Sunday, I'm listening to an audiobook, I'm making dinner, which, like, pats on the back, snaps and claps, went out drinking yesterday, had friends, and I'm still able to stand and make dinner, so thank you the Lord who's blessing me with this recovery from fatigue. Anyway, that's a ramble. I thought I'd just tell you what I'm making because it's really quick and like low energy. So I'm making a gluten-free pasta bake, so easy. So this is the pasta I'm using. I don't have like a, I'm not obsessed with gluten-free pasta, like it is hard to find a good one, but I do rate this brand, Gaffalue. This is like a weird wiggly one, but. All I find with gluten-free pasta is that you've just got to cook it for long enough and make sure that it's like super saucy. Um, so all I'm doing is boiling a pan for that and then super simple sauce, passata, I don't eat onion and garlic, I've told you before. Um, merchant French lentils mixed in, a bit of cream cheese and got this new oil from Liddell. I mean Liddell, sorry, that's my mum that calls it that. Basil infused olive oil. Put that together shove it in the oven, mix it together, shove it in the oven, just mix it in the pan where the water's boiling. And then I'm just tray roasting a ton of mushrooms, courgettes, cherry tomatoes, and some leftover broccoli. Roast that all with balsamic and olive oil. And then I sort of, instead of roasting that and mixing it together, putting it in, I just serve my pasta bake, veggies on the side, um, a bunch of salad, and that's it, like two pounds dirty. So that's my situation for dinner but I was going to tell you also about what I'm reading so I'm just going to tell you about the audiobook I'm listening to now which is The Empire of Pain by Patrick Radden Keefe if you have followed this channel for a while you know that I'm a Patrick Radden Keefe fan and that I loved um wow say nothing that took me a while to think of um his book on the Irish trouble he's an Irish American researcher writer and the Empire of Pain is on the Sackler family, which I'm sure if you are familiar with arts and philanthropy, that is such a hard word to say, philanthropy um, in the US or um, the UK for that matter, because they sponsor a lot of our art galleries here, they sponsor the Louvre, um, and they are a hugely rich and influential family who made their fortune in pharmaceuticals, one of which was OxyContin, which is widely assumed as the drug that started the opioid crisis in prescription opioids and addiction over in the US. So it's basically tracing their family history. Um, Radin Keefe has done exactly the same thing that he did in his um, book in Ireland where he focuses in on um, a particular event. So we open in the lawyer's office with one of the elder Sackler families who's being, who's under defamation for She's being sued by like a bunch of like states, counties, hospitals, all for like her involvement in the opioid crisis essentially. And then we track back to how they started to buy the businesses, why they got into pharmaceuticals, like the tracing of the family line. Um, super interesting. It's 18 hours on audio. There is no way I would pick up this book as a physical book. Firstly, my hands couldn't carry it. And secondly, I don't have the attention span to hold on to that dryness of... Um, fiction it's definitely like he writes books that are very gripping but you do have to have an interest in the topic as you do with any 800 page book that you're about to devote your multiple weeks to at a time but i'm loving it so much so far and i can't wait for my friends to read it so i can talk to them about it too so yeah i would catch up with you probably once i finish my pasta bake hey friends long time no chat or not really because you're watching a vlog so you wouldn't have noticed whether it's long time no chat anyway enjoying a plate of oranges on this sweet Tuesday afternoon and here to tell you that I have officially, officially, I just merged officially and finished together, officially handed in my final essay for university this morning, so I'm a free woman for five months until I start my master's degree, but um, 
feel so good. It doesn't even feel real right now. It's like I had this guilt looming over me, especially as I've been so unwell the last six months of being like every time I rest or any time I do something that's not related to my health or related to university, I'm like, oh my God, I'm wasting energy when I should be doing uni work or, you know, it's just like constantly on your mind all the time, even when you're not doing it. And just to be free of that feeling feels effing amazing, I won't lie. Um, I'm hopefully going to pick up some freelance work this summer. I'm not well enough to go back to like the jobs I had before or whatever, like when I was well, well, more well, which was like childcare, nannying, tutoring. Those are like very physically taxing jobs to have as well as mentally taxing. So unfortunately I won't be doing back, going back there, but I will be hopefully picking up some more copywriting work, um, getting a few more regular clients working on some writing stuff, writing, working on some articles, lots of exciting things are on the horizon for that. So I hope to bring you along this summer doing that. But um, I have hardly done any reading this week, so I just wanted to finish that goddamn essay. Um, but I'm about to pick up a new book, which I thought I'd just show you one planning on reading this vlog. And I feel like I always do this and then they're not the books I read, but these are the books I'm going to read as well. The first one is Voyeur by Francesca Reese. So this is like very much like a summer what I would like take on holiday read. Me and Tom actually did just book a holiday, which is so exciting to the UK. We're doing a road trip up to Newcastle, away the lads, um, to go and get tattooed and of course stop in on GK Reads, um, which I'm so excited for. So can't wait to vlog in some different places for you. But anyway, this is the kind of book I would take on holiday if I was going on like a pool holiday. Um, it was kindly sent to me by Tinder Press, who are a imprint of Headline. So it's a um, tells the story of Leah, a young British woman living in a restless existence in Paris. She finds herself signing up to spend a summer transcribing the diaries of a notable author, an author in his house in the south of France. Looks at privilege in the arts, the male gaze and memory. Fans of Anna Hope and Nisha Dolan. Tick, 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 tick. That like setting of south of France reminds me of um, uh, James Baldwin's uh, novel that I read last year. And... But like it'd be really interesting to get into like a chunky book. I've been really put off doing that while I was studying because my attention span is shorter. The amount of time I have to read in the evenings is shorter. So I haven't been like thinking about picking up books like this, but it's out on the 10th of June, which is like in a couple of days. So hopefully I'll be reading this and talking about it on my Instagram off uh, before you see this vlog. And then the other small nonfiction I'm gonna pick up is I'm Afraid of Men by Vivek Shara. You would have seen in my wrap up, which I'm actually about to film, but because of YouTube time, you'll see that then you'll see this I read Vivek um I read their novel the subtweet and I loved it surprisingly loved it and this is a small book about uh like a non-fiction extended essay about her life of enduring cruelty for being too feminine as a boy and not feminine enough as a girl and it's basically about their trans experience in writing in art um and they I believe are from Canada I'm gonna say because I read, um, yeah, she is one half of the music duo and a publishing imprint treating, she teaches creative writing at the University of Cal Calgary, which is in Canada. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. And then I thought I would just show you a little book called, which is kind of, uh, mm -mm, is it cheating? Cheating what, Hannah? I showed you, I talked about these books in last week's vlog because I went to an event with all of these authors and I wanted to pick up their books. One I bought, uh, me and Tom like bought them to share. Um, I managed to find two second hand, which was a win on World of Books. Um, but I got The Photographer at 16 by George Sizette, which is um, a memoir looking at the life of his mother and their experiences, um, his mother's experiences in Hungary in the concentration camps and later escape and become refugees and move to England in the late 50s. And it sort of uncovers her experiences. Originally, she was born in Transylvania. I've never read a book or a memoir or anything about someone who's Transylvanian. I think that's really interesting. Um, and he is a poet by, by profession. So of course, you know, a poet writing anything that's not poetry, ironically, I love, but particularly a poet writing nonfiction, personal memoir, sign me up. And it's a little short one, so I'm excited about that. Excuse me, oh my God, why do oranges taste so much better in the summer? Then I picked up Olivia Sujek's first novel, which I obviously adored, um, Asylum Road. So this is sort of like a similar age protagonist, 23, move, moves to New York and she finds a Japanese writer that she becomes affixed with online. Um, and she, 
hones in on her internet twin and their lives begin to blur blood ties and sexual encounters that can't be erased i think this would be a really interesting look at the internet novel before the internet novel took off to how we see it now because i think this was published 2017 but that's that premise sounds quite or like has some similarities to what i rem yeah 2017 what i remember um from jenny offal's writing and from lauren euler so i'll be interested in olivia's take on that really not impressed with this cover upsetting but most upsettingly is i bought reef which was romesh gunkaserka's um book i was he's got like a huge discography but this was the book i was most interested in when i heard him talk and it's a love story set in sri lanka um a told our narrator is tritton who's aimed age 11 he works as a house miss house boy for a marine biologist and he learns to polish silver and he recounts his story as a naive young and fearful boy becoming a man in chaos but i ordered this like specifically paid extra on world of books so i thought it had a different cover i hate this cover it looks like a national geographic situation not my vibe at all but it was, it was published by grant so this is like quite an old book but whatever i think it was like four pounds this is their debut so that's what i got there um and I'll catch up with you tomorrow. I've got treatment, but then, because I'm a free woman these days, and my friends are texting me saying it's really hot, show we do a beach day? And I was like, yeah. That's because I'm very blessed to have friends that work in creative, like, non-nine-to-five jobs. Like, my friend, my friends came at the, make at the weekend, one's makeup artist, one works in retail, so they, like, always work peculiar hours. So I love when our worlds can collide midweek. Uh, so I might do that tomorrow, and if I do, I'll show you, but I'm definitely going to go for a swim later because it is gorgeous outside. flattering angle or outfit but i'm early for um perrin treatment tonight got a late night session so i thought i'd just tell you i've listened to i think i've only got six hours left of um empire of pain by patrick random keith when i say it is wild i just cannot be He's just such an excellent and brilliant investigative journalist, writer. He really draws you into the story, you know, lulls you into this sense of knowing these these characters, these people as humans, and then, like, quickly uncovers them as hideous, greedy, capitalist scum, essentially. Um, so I think I mentioned in the last clip that I spoke about it, it's basically all about the Oxycontin um drug like pharmaceutical market and how that led to the opioid crisis in the u.s and it's just absolutely hideous um there's there's part of it which is about the sackler family history and there was this great phrase they used about um this obsession with the talis talismanic nature of a name and how the sacklers through all the generations were so obsessed with having their name on things but then in the same breath they were distancing themselves and purposely deceiving the public by not naming things that they were involved in that had the potential to go wrong like the pharmaceutical business so they all operate under this name like the, per the purdue company and all sorts of different names they operate all these different companies it's basically like a mass scheme of corruption how they had their drugs companies which they then fed into doctors that they were bribing which they fed into medical journals that they were running which they fed into um these pain clinics these pill mills it was just it's just absolutely wild that this level of corruption was happening to the point where they were even paying off the fda which is like the american drug administration um when they were being investigated to the point they then hired the people who left the fda to end up working for them and it's just like it's grim it's fucking grim i'll tell you that but it is um very gripping to read and i can't believe how quickly i'm getting through it considering it's like an 18 hour audiobook so 
um, I can highly recommend it if you're interested in the opioid crisis. It, it's also not, it does feature a few individual family cases of people that have been um, affected and harmed by drug addiction, particularly a very interesting case of someone within the company who um, was prescribed OxyContin and then started using it and how they you know, hid so much of the paperwork and when even she came out and said, like, I have a problem, um, they just basically fired her and said that she... They, 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 they take the hard line that, like, the drugs aren't the problem, it's the people, it's the users that choose to become addicts and it's just, like, such a, a, like, a flawed way of looking at um, substance abuse. But, um, oh, I forgot what the first point I was making was... Yeah, it's extremely interesting, but so it features some individual stories, but it doesn't really lean into, so far at least, individual, like, tragedies, so to speak, about um, people that are, you know, um, have substance abuse disorders and then fall into, like, a myriad of different life challenges, um, which I quite like. Like, I quite like the nitty-gritty side from this part of the... Um, corporate like capitalist world instead of just the impact of the drugs on the people um because I mean that is even more distressing to read about and also I have read and watched a lot of documentaries about that kind of that side of the opioid crisis and sort of first responders and um people who become homeless or people that lose access to their children etc etc so this is like a, a sort of like the, the other side of the coin which I'm really enjoying so yeah highly recommend it and hopefully we'll literally finish it this weekend probably. I'm done with treatment, eating a vegan magnum. <laughs> won't, won't tell my neuro, my practitioner about that because I'm on tea soy. Mm, I just wanted to say me and Tom have got really into Audible original podcast. I'm wondering if you guys would be interested in, in us sitting down and talking about our favourite podcast series. Like, not just like news and pop culture podcasts, but more like produce series that we like anyway we're really into the audible ones right now we've just done the rise of the iron men which was really interesting and now we're about we're just three episodes into the dark web and we just listened to an episode on the silk road and it's so interesting how basically the entirety of the dark web is underwritten by the u.s defense force and they fund a lot of nefarious things well yeah and it seems like it persists because they want to have their cake of having this thing which allows an anonymity but then they want to eat it as well because it's like oh we want we want to keep it but we don't want all the bad people to use it but obviously you can't do that because it's not like they're any less technologically sufficient in mm. setting up all of these dodgy the only thing i will say is that it's got some quite random sound production on it and yeah, they use some really stereotypical voice things. actors for like when they're talking about drugs which was a bit disappointing but yeah let us know in the comments if you'd be interested in a video on podcasts From my mum's beautiful garden. Not sure if you can hear Tom talking in a conference um, outside, but I just wanted to show you the lovely greenery of my mum's garden and this really cool vintage. It's actually CNA, which is like one of my favourite brands to search. If you guys follow me on Instagram, you'd have seen the other yesterday. I did like a things I don't need to buy but you need to buy on eBay and I got so much good feedback from it it was really funny I actually got this twin set um second hand in a flea market in Amsterdam one of my favorite ones to go to I will link it down below if any of my dark torches are interested um but it was like a long pair of culottes and I just cropped it and hemmed them into these little shorts and it's so comfy and I feel like these like matching twin sets are really in but I got it for 10 euros. Anyway, not trying to be a fashion blogger here, just lots of you guys left such nice comments every time I show my outfits, which is really cute. Um, I've read pretty much most of this. Oh, no, that's a lie, two thirds. Uh, um, I'm Afraid of Men by Vivek Shara. I uh, absolutely love it. It's one of those like very short, succinct essays that's like 
setting out the parameters of which it's going to talk about it's obviously not going to cover everything to do with toxic masculinity and the representation of well, the experiences of trans women interacting with cis het men um but yeah i just think she's saying so many brilliant things i'm just going to read you a couple of bits oh hi tintin oh you can't come up here because I'm sitting on the outdoor sofa but without the sofa on it um so she says, after receiving an immersive education in high school and the necessity of camouflage is the only viable means to persevere, I decide to mask myself as one of my attackers. An assimilation into manhood is my true transition. So she talks about her experience growing up um, and trying to embody like, hegemonic masculinity as a form of self-protection and feeling like it was okay to, in like slightly coming of age, and identify as gay, but still make sure that they um, interacted with others and asserted themselves as masculine because of the um, safety implications of you know exploring gender in any other way that was not hegemonic um, so I thought that was really interesting and then um, there was a really great bit which I think relate will relate to a lot of um, cis women as well about why is being touched by strangers, strangers who refuse to identify themselves, a form of flattery. And she talks about going into nightclubs and this idea that queerness is associated with a freedom from boundaries, thus any boundary is inherently unqueer. Yet this entitlement is only reinforced by my cautionness with gay men. And I thought that was really interesting, the idea of um, like spaces outside of the norm, i.e. queer spaces or um, socially progressive spaces or politically advanced spaces being these places where people rule break and transgress the norm but therefore it blurs so many personal boundaries that people may hold and i think that um is a really like complex set of ideas to unpick um like personal and collective boundaries but she also talks about her experiences teaching anti-homophobic and anti-transphobic workshops in colleges and this idea of like the good ally that comes into this um spaces thinking like what more can you teach me about this thing i'm a good person kind of back to that uh like has attachment to those ideas of like the good white person if you read whites by otega Oakba last summer i believe i will link that down below that's i'll link my instagram review is one of the best um books in the like anti-racist genre that i've read and it's really just like a critique of allyship and performativity and i, I really enjoyed it but and this feels similar to that in the sense of unpicking those ideas that she talks about in here this idea of like um having to express or share your trauma with people in order to humanize yourself and people to then want to be a part of your cause and she says sort of like people come into her the workshops and talk about how why can't we just have gender separate bathrooms like why do we need to share and then when vivek shares stories of their experiences and other colleagues experiences with um segregated gender spaces as in bodies that are gender non-conforming that then people suddenly start to change their mind and be like oh yeah okay i guess like yeah that does make sense or like oh i'm so sorry that happened to you and how we need to express pity to people in order to humanize them and you can see that across you know all sorts of um social justice issues whether that's refugees disabled people um people living racialized lives like homeless people people who use drugs like all of those things it involves some level of pity in order for the person who is not oppressed by whatever intersection we're talking about to feel like they're the person's cause is worth fighting for and like that is such a fucked up concept she says i've always been disturbed by this transition but the reality by the reality that is often the only way we can capture someone's attention and encourage them to recognize their internal bias and work to alter them is to confront them with the sensational stories of our suffering why is in my humanity is only seen or cared about when I share the ways in which I've been victimized and violated? And I think about that a lot, like now I'm doing more writing and writing about illness and disability and sharing some really hard and traumatic um, medical experiences and how people consistently tell me that's brave or inspiring and how that doesn't really sit right with me as an idea. And then I sort of think, am I selling my soul by my only writing being about my own trauma? I don't know. And obviously like, my trauma in comparison to someone writing about like their racialized experience like that's so different but it's all the same idea of like we need to exploit ourselves in order to humanize ourselves i don't know that was a very long ramble about this book but yeah i'm gonna finish it off now in the sun and i'm having such a glorious day 
feeling free and just like taking a moment to breathe and decide my next steps for the summer. So yeah. I know this seems like such a small thing, but mm, I just got mm, really yummy fruit drink from Capinero. But I'm just running an errand for my mum. My grandmother's really unwell. I mean, she's bloody 96, so she's still kicking, but um, she was like in hospital over the weekend, so I'm just like going to pharmacy doing errands for my mum. And it just feels so good to be able to help out again. And like, I know that was like not really a big deal to loads of people, but I like. Six months ago, I couldn't even drive the car or go anywhere by myself. And now I'm like able to just run an errand and like drive to the next town, sort of get some flowers for my grandma. Like it just feels really good to get that sense of independence back, um, which I know is a privilege because obviously I work from home and like the work I do is sporadic and freelance and I'm in a privileged position where I have savings, blah, 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 blah. But so I'd share that joy with you while I go to see my grandma, who's actually not there because we're turning her bathroom into like an accessible wet room at the moment so she's not home but the builders will be so yeah good morning folks haven't spoken to you in a bit um oh god why is my washing over just had a day, a morning even, so in like 10 now, of doing chores. I wore, um, changed the bed sheet, it's hence why there's a bed sheet drying up there. Did the washing, tidied up a bit, sorted out clothes, you know. Boring, boring, but I wanted to update you on some books and some posts that I just got. Not bookish posts, normal posts. But I finished Empire of Pain by Paget Radenkeith this morning while I was doing my chores. I don't know how I got through that so quickly. It's like an 18 hour audiobook and I was only listening to it on 1.1. Got a really painful thing in my ear um but i absolutely loved it it is such an accurate and brilliant piece of investigative journalism taking down what is one of as described in the book the greediest and sickest um families in america it's just abhorrent the levels of deception they went to and all not even just them as, as the Sackler family, just all the different government bodies and people that were co-opting with them to manufacture a crisis that they still refuse to take responsibility for. And they still have these archaic views about addiction and um, substance abuse disorders. And it's just so blood boiling to listen to. Um, and just poked holes in so much of the US. And I mean, similarly, there was a few clips about how some of the family members were moving to London as a popular place for oligarchs with um, suspicious funds to come and live. Because of course, like the laws we have in this country about tax evasion and all that kind of stuff is very easy for those people to come and settle. And it's just ugh, absolutely disgusting, but an absolutely brilliant read. If you loved Patrick Redding-Keefe's um, 
previous book and you don't really know about Sackler family or if you do know about Sackler family and you want to know more this is like definitely the most in-depth article I've read his original op-ed when it first came out two years ago just because of I'm not really sure how I got interested in knowing about the crisis I think it was related there was like um she talks in the book a lot about Nan Golden and Nan Golden's experience has an uh, opioid user addict and then um her like one woman crusade against the Sacklers and Oxycontin and all of the different um exhibitions and actions she went to um after she recovered and I think that's how I got into it so and um, on that note if anyone has read and got any biography or um sort of like I don't think she has her own memoir I think she's written fiction but if anyone's read any good books about Nan Golding I would love to read them she is an artist I really admire I think I've seen three of her retrospectives and collections me and Tom actually one of the first holidays we ever took to Dublin I took him to an Anne Golden exhibition he's probably like why um but yeah I loved all of that like I loved that information about art about links to um universities higher education how so much of our higher education funding comes from really corrupt places and what students are doing about it it is so watertight in its um fact checking that afterward is brilliant the way he talks about um you know how he was followed and how people were trying to get him to not write this book it's just like you know hats off to him I think it's a, a brilliant piece of work and he said like this is not the definitive book on the opioid crisis I just hope this provides information for more people to want to write about it and investigate all the different facets of it because like he said there's like millions of pages of paperwork and depositions and everything that go into it and as time goes on more will be released through freedom of information Act, and then more people will be able to write about something that they've tried so hard to cover up um so yeah, love, love, loved it. And then this was exciting, it came in the post. I ordered this the other day and I didn't know it was gonna come that quickly. The company's called Two Better Days. I ordered a trial pack, they're pain patches, but um, they are homeopathic, I guess. And it was nine quid for the pack. So mm, not your grandma, Hannah, who makes the um, like pot socks. If you've seen her on Instagram, she posted about really liking them and I really trust her opinion. So I thought I'd give it a go, you get nine stickers for 10 quid so i'm gonna try to stay because i've had an endo flare for the last couple of days um so i'm hoping it will work and of course i will report back to you if i do and the other thing you guys know my favorite candle company in the world is the botanical candle company and they made this scent years ago called laundry day which is like one of my favorite smells that like clean cotton just washed um oh they've also updated their packaging and now it's printed um smell and they were doing like a limited re-release i literally got the email and ordered it straight away i don't know if there's any more still in stock Ooh, i'll have a look for you it's in the metal tin but um if you like those oh my god also oh my god i can smell it already oh it smells so good it smells like fabric conditioner but without any of the bad stuff in it oh my god delicious um what was I was going to say on a health update? I've had really sore joints in my like my fingers are so sore and swollen. I have to get Tom to help me to open my pill box. So if you guys have any recommendations for stuff for that, like homeopathic stuff, would be interested in hearing about it. So I've got the reed diffusers. So I was like probably going to give this to my mom um, because she loves them. And then on the book front, I'm reading voyeur by francesca reese so i started this the other day it's published by tinder press which is hachette i believe it's a debut book about a girl quite lost in life like just a graduate out of university she moves to paris where she did her third year like erasmus course and um ends up sort of like taking a, a set like a sort of job basically like entangled in this um very famous aloof writer who published his last book like 20 years ago and she goes to work for him to manage his correspondence and then do some research for him on a book that he's writing in their like family house in the south of France. But there's a lot of like sort of mystery involved. Like he thinks that she looks like his daughter who is either missing, passed away or estranged. We don't know yet. And um, another daughter comes to stay and a son um, of the family and they sort of get embroiled in this family saga sort of like um, misshapen family situation the headline is seeing is deceiving and it was sold to me as if you like Nisha Dolan which I do and I'm really enjoying it it's got some really sharp like funny takes about sort of millennial 
class culture and um you know like Oxbridge and all those kind of like commentaries that I find really funny and interesting and it switches perspectives between the girl Leah and the author Michael I'm having a good time with that and then while I was in my pain flare I started you know your endo by Jessica Monet which is also published by Headline Press this is an Amera she's an American writer and person living with endometriosis so the headline is an empowering guide to health and hope with endometriosis um I like feel not ill-informed but like I don't know a ton about my own endometriosis because I got like a barrage of um diagnosis all at the same time earlier this year and once I had my endosurgery I was sort of like well I'll just put that on the back burner for now but I just read the foreword and the introduction so far and the first chapter which is called making yourself a priority and I cried like it was just it's just absolutely brilliant it's definitely it's like a work um which could be like a workbook format and um, I imagine if you had the finished copy it would be like easier but I'm gonna show you what I wrote but it's got like these sections to fill in like what does like what does your best life look like when you live with endo or like what are some of the endo wins you've had so far what are the things you hope for life with endometriosis and the first chapter is basically just about like how it's not selfish to care about your own well-being and like prioritize your health when you live with an incurable condition and I feel like it's gonna be so meaningful and helpful and I'm on a mission this summer to read more about endo and I've got a couple of books on my TBR so I thought now's better than any to pick that up so yeah I'm actually going to the hairdressers the this morning Tom just came back from the hairdressers it's a haircut day in the family um and then we might stay in town and have some lunch and do some work on our laptops what a treat so I'll take you with me Pulitzer announcement just came out and I was just chatting to the Hardys about it. I'm not like that big into the Pulitzer. To me, it always felt like a lifetime achievement type of award. I know Nickel Boys won last year or the year before. And obviously I love the Nickel Boys. And did the Sympathizer win, which is like one of Tom's favorite books because I know Go said that Vian Fen Nguden is on the um, like literary board. Wow, I feel like this is the first time I've come on with my new haircut and it doesn't look good because I've taken a nap. But I just got these little like curtain bangs put in. Um anyway, back to Peli Pelitza? Pelitza. Um so Louise Erdridge just won. Also don't mind this. Um, which is I have no interest in reading it. I think it's like a war novel, I'm pretty sure. Um, but that's why I think it's like Lifetime because people's predictions were like... Um, and Tyler and, you know, like oldie worldy sort of like esteemed literary people. I always feel like it's that kind of book. And I know obviously Colson Whitehead, like his two most recent books have been the most famous, but he does have a, like a really long backlog. Um, but one book I am interested in reading that was like the second recommended one is Telephone by Percival Everett, because I saw that on a couple of people's Instagram. I think I first saw it on Daryl's D Sweet Library. If you follow him on Insta, he is amazing. Um, his book buying is absolutely savage um, makes me feel better about my book buying habits so would recommend following him just for that alone but he I'm pretty sure it's him who told me about telephone and it's like um it features illness like progressive illness which is really interesting of a young girl um but it's three separate endings as in like there are three versions of the book that are being sold handed to reviewers and so I think that's such an interesting co um, concept and it's like very much like a contemporary like in contemporary America type of book so I feel like I'll pick that up at some point um but which copy will I get and which one did they review for the for the recommendation for the Pulitzer did they read all three like how did that work um it sounds like it could be gimmicky but like I feel like for which is why I probably didn't want to read it before but if the Pulitzer are recommending it then who am I to say um, anyway, that's my short take on that. I'm gonna go back to reading now. Bye. Hi, is it possible to book a table for the 1st of July, please? Granny, what's wrong? I don't know. She said she wouldn't stop crying. 
Yes. Hey friends, I'm just going to sign off the vlog here so I can start a new one tomorrow. But I just wanted to say I'm now like a third of the way through Voya and I'm really liking it. It's like light but smart. And you know, I struggle to find like good light fiction, like poolside reading vibe that isn't inadvertently racist, sexist or homophobic. So that's a plus. Um, Francesca Reese is doing a good job of that. Um, it's highlighting some really interesting, like just offhand comments about like privilege and class in the UK and um, life in France. And it's really interesting. Um, I just filmed a couple of videos, which is good, productive. And I will catch up with you guys in the next vlog. So thank you so much for watching. See you soon. Bye.